if I'd been signing Ronaldinho, it would have been from our five-a-side team at the time. It was one of the weirdest things that's happened to me since I moved here. Really, the way to explain it is that when Ronaldinho was at Paris Saint-Germain, he had a president, uh, President Kai was his name. And as everybody knows, United were deep in negotiations with Ronaldinho to try and sign him, to the extent that they reached a verbal agreement with Paris Saint-Germain. Now, what happened was that Kai and Peter Kenyon agreed something verbally. The facts came in from Manchester United, and the amount didn't tally with what had been agreed verbally. So I was here in uh, Sitges Beach, enjoying a day off in the late sort of spring, thinking, yeah, life in Spain isn't too bad. This is as much, but as much work as I want to commit to. And the phone goes, and it's Ian McGarry, who's now working for the BBC, and Ian McGarry said, I, I can tell you for sure that negotiations have broken down between Paris Saint-Germain and Manchester United. It's not out yet. The French media don't know. I've spoken to somebody who's spoken directly to the Paris Saint-Germain president. Phone Barcelona, because they've given up. Phone Barcelona now. I had a mutual friend who were going to meet on this tour of Barcelona camp now and chatting about the book. Phone Juanjo Castillo and said, Juanjo, uh, your boss, the vice president, Sandro Rosé, better know now he's got a chance. He's got to get in there. The deal stopped with United. The deal happened with Football Club Barcelona. And this big buck-toothed Brazilian, I'm not knocking him, look at these, arrived and, 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 and was a catalytic player. Changed everything. He, he made the world fall in love with Football Club Barcelona again. It was the beginning of something very special. A weak team that was in the process of going six years without a trophy was what Ronaldinho came to, to rescue. And, and it was... It was sold to him that he was going to be some sort of cavalier figure, some guy to, to, to take the pressure of reinventing the club on his shoulders. They'd had years where Van Gaal had run out of ideas. The crowd were against him. He'd been sacked. Joanne Gaspar, the president, had been literally booed out of um, his own stadium. And it was like when there's a lynch mob. You know, with the torches going up to the castle to get the, the, the baron who's got the evil monster. That's what it was like. The fans were hunting for the people responsible for the decline of this, this great club. When Ronaldinho came into the dressing room, he was muscular, live, quick. He was just about to explode. I guess you'd say he was in his prime. And, and the first memory I have of the wow factor was the game that kicked off at five past midnight. I won't go into the reasons why Seville and Barcelona with an argument kicked off at five past midnight. The stadium was full, 98,000 people. They were 1-0 down to Jose Antonio Reyes' penalty and Ronaldinho picked up the ball about two countries away. Dribbled past 75 people and burst the net from 35 yards. And the roar that went up that night at about 25 to 1 was so much that the seismographs, it was so quiet in the rest of the city, and so noisy, the roar from the camp now. Seismographs picked up a little bit of activity like that, and you knew then, and so it proved that there's something special in terms of the football, but also the personality. And they say Carino here, the, the love, the affection that he drew like a magnet to Barcelona. That was, you knew something extraordinary was happening. But the two sadnesses with Ronaldinho are, are that, you know, genetically he was born with a need to party and an and ability to put on extra weight. He won them trophies. He, he made them, it was like Messi, he made them better, even better. However well the rest of them were playing football, Ronaldinho was the difference. Um, he didn't have his greatest game in Paris in the 2006 final, but he still was the player that everybody feared, the player that could give a flick or a goal or hold a player off. And he started living this beach life, okay, not in this beach, but the one just down the coast in, in Castellel Fells where he lived eating burgers and steaks and drinking beer in what are called chiringuitos, the little cafes you see dotted up and down every beach and partying. He's a, he's a really good musician. And um, gradually the training became less important. The waistband grew. The reason that we're here against, fighting against the backdrop of the sea is that his beach life meant he was unfit to carry Barcelona's weight and he was carrying too much of his own weight. Pep Guardiola came in and I got it wrong. I, I, I was unclear how a, a young man with one year's experience training kids could deal with these big egos. And the way he dealt with them was in his first press conference, he said, uh, there's no place for Ronaldinho in my club. He's out of our plans. He's out of this club. And his first day at work, 
It was remarkable, and he told us all, frankly, and went and told Ronaldinho to his face like a man. And the cycle had changed just like that.